Hello, Helen, I would like to welcome you to the 62nd Annual International ASI Convention here at the Phoenix Civic Center in beautiful but very hot Phoenix, Arizona. And it's an honor to be here. You know, Molly Sue, a lot of people, a lot of our viewers understand and know, comprehend what 3ABN means, which is Three Angels Broadcasting Network. However, there's probably a lot of them out there that do not know what ASI stands for. ASI is the Adventist Layman Services and Industries, and 3ABN has been broadcasting the ASI conventions now how for over 20 years. You know, we have a lot of history with ASI. How long have we been interacting with them? Well, it really is over 20 years. You know, each in, uh, uh, convention that we've brought to you, we have just been delighted to be able to share with our 3ABN family around the world the many different ways that people around the world are sharing Jesus Christ in their area where they work in their marketplace. And as you can tell now, we have a wonderful song service in progress, and we would like to invite you to join us now in the song service. to sing with this ASI Youth Orchestra. Thank you for pouring your hearts into these strains. We're going to open with the famous, wonderful hymn, And Can It Be? When Jesus' name is so powerful and he did so much to save us, all we can say is how, how could he do that for me? And can it be that he would do that for me? Please stand together as we sing. Welcome, ASI. Thank you for singing. Sing from your hearts. Let's sing.
are singing. Thank you, ASI Orchestra. Good evening. Welcome to ASI. We'd like to invite you all to stand as we give our opening prayer. Dear Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you so much for this time that we've come. And Father, we've come for a blessing. And as each one of us has come from our different places, we pray that you'd send your Holy Spirit, guide each one that will speak and share about their ministry, and help us all, Lord, that we may be more encouraged to go forward and bring these things into practice into our different workplaces and our ministries. And we thank you so much for the promise of your presence. For this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Good evening. 
There are so many ministries that are going on all over the world and sharing Christ in the marketplace is now worldwide for our organization. And so to th this evening we have the ASI president for Europe and we also have, who is Angel Duo, and we have Radim Passer, who is the VP, v Vice President for Evangelism. They're now going to tell us about how Europe is sharing Christ in the marketplace. Um, it's nice to be here again, and uh, a blessing to be here sharing with you the experiences that we are having in Europe. It's challenging the work there. But ASI is a growing force in Europe. In this moment, we are present in 14 countries, and our membership is more than 700 members already, and growing. But uh, the main challenge is to get all the lay people moving, working for Jesus Christ, and preaching the gospel. And that is what we are trying to do. And uh, we are very happy because we are finding a lot of support in it is written, for instance, with uh, whom we are developing the program with the new beginnings and uh, working with, in small groups in all different countries. In Spain, particularly, we, we've had a great experience the last months with that program. And uh, in the few months, in, in October, we are going to have reaping campaigns all over the country. and. Uh, Pastor Robert Costa is going to lead the main one in Barcelona City, and 25 members of ASI are going to lead their own uh, campaigns in different uh, towns all over the country. So uh, this is what we want to do all over Europe, and um, we're sure that uh, we're going to do it with the Lord's help. We are also very active in uh, youth evangelism not only evangelism, also training, and Radim will talk a little bit about that just in a, in, in a minute. But I can proudly say that we've been working this year in a very important city that is Santiago de Compostela. That is the second Catholic city in the world. And uh, we have a very small church there, but we've had our young people working, and the, the result has been great because all our young people are, uh, you know, very happy with the work they have done there. And um, we've uh, reached the number of four baptisms at the end. And that in that place, I can tell you, is, is something. We also have a lot of people with Bible studies, and uh, we, uh, we, we praise the Lord for the work that has been done there. But this is also being done in England, in other countries in Europe, but that I will let Radim, that is the responsible for evangelism in Europe, to go on with that. It is my privilege to be here with you. Good evening. Uh, first of all, I would like to uh, I would like to thank God I can be here because if uh, 12 years ago anybody told me uh, or put me question. Uh, uh, about the preaching gospel in the Europe, I, I would ask him probably what is the preaching the gospel. <laughs> but uh, God is merciful. Uh, Europe is, of course, a difficult mission field. Maybe some of you can hear uh, Macedonian calling, uh, like Apostle Paul from Europe a few years ago. And uh, I think we have, uh, we have to be good example for our members because we, we need to wake up. We have good tools at the moment. Uh, we translated uh, DVD programs, New Beginnings, in many languages. Uh, we started to use uh, program Use for Jesus in some countries in Europe, like France, uh, Spain, Great Britain, Hungary, Czech Republic, and few others. Of course, uh, it's also very important to have schools for training our uh, evangelists and missionary workers. It is very important. It's nice also to see every year more and more people, including youth in Europe, uh, uh, to have patient uh, sharing the Christ. But of course, we, we would need much more workers for God's work. Uh, in many countries, we're starting to work with uh, small groups. 
and that's why, as Angel said, we are preparing some uh, ripping uh, campaigns uh, in some cities like Rome, Italy, Barcelona, Spain, Lisbon, Portugal, and Prague, Czech Republic. And uh, please uh, pray for Europe. Because some years, uh, some centuries ago, we exported Christianity to the whole world, and now we are in quite opposite situation. Uh, also, I would like to mention a little bit, uh, as I work in Czechoslovak Union, we have about 100 members. Every year we have convention uh, attending approximately 1,000 people, which is about 10% uh, of the membership since the Adventists in our country. And uh, usually we support it uh, about 20 projects every year. Uh, what is important, these projects brought already many or nice number of baptisms. Uh, also in our country we have main projects used for Jesus and new beginnings. Uh, and we are preparing for 2011 in spring uh, some reaping campaign uh, with, uh, together with It Is Written. So uh, we have a lot of work and we are asking you for your prayers. Thank you, Radim and Angel. Best luck. And television, as we know, is one of the main mediums by which the world will hear about the gospel of Jesus Christ. And here we have Ron, uh, we have Ron and Marta Davis of KBLN TV. Would you tell us about what KBLN is and does? Well, first of all, I'd like to say we are so happy to be here with our ASI family. Um, just love it when we're here. We really are, and we'd be happy to tell you about uh, KBLN. And, and uh, we go by the uh, KBLN's our, our full power station call letters in, uh, uh, for a television station in Grants Pass, Oregon. Uh, the uh, name of our organization is Better Life Broadcasting Network. And uh, we, were, we were in Dallas about, well, it was three years ago. Uh, introducing the idea that that we would be purchasing a full power another full power television station in Roseburg area and then uh, along with that a low power television station in Eugene and so we're here to tell you about the rest of the story Please. so far but before we do we'd like to show you a short uh, video Hello, Better Life family. I'm Bart Shields, director of His Song Chorale, and I'm honored to be associated with the ministry of Better Life Broadcasting Network. I am blessed today to share with you the mighty things God has done and is continuing to do through His broadcast ministry. But first, some quick history on how it all started some 20 plus years ago. I remember when our founders, Delmer and Evelyn Wagner, saw the need to have clean, wholesome, and inspiring television programming in the Rogue Valley area here in Southern Oregon. Back in 1988, they ventured out in faith, seeking how that need could become a reality. But in 1990, Better Life was on the air with their first over-the-air broadcast station, and now, 16 broadcast stations later, with a 6,000 square foot facility, we reach a potential viewing audience of over half a million people. Very soon, we will more than double our potential viewing audience, to over one million people with the acquisition of the Roseburg Full Power Station and the Eugene Low Power Station. By operating the Roseburg Full Power Station, the Federal Communications Commission requires that all cable and satellite providers carry our broadcast on their basic programming packages in that designated market area. This will cover the counties of Benton, Coos, Douglas, and Lane. Next on the horizon is the opportunity to triple our potential viewing audience to 3 million people with the acquisition of a low-power digital station in the Portland area. This station will broadcast into 51 conference church areas in the counties of Washington, Clackamas, Columbia, and Multnomah, along with Clark County in the state of Washington. What an evangelistic tool to reach our neighbors in the comfort of their home with a message of hope they so desperately need. Catch the vision of those that have seen this ministry flourish from the roots of its conception. Time is short. Invest today in God's kingdom building work right here in Oregon. Thank you very much and may the Lord richly bless you.
Praise the Lord. He has been so good uh, to Better Life and the and and actually uh, all of Southern Oregon and and soon to be all of Oregon. We are. Uh, we believe God has given us the directive to go ye and into all of Oregon and further down into Northern California. So we're on our way uh, to do just that. We've taken him very seriously about that directive, and he's providing the opportunities to uh, continue to go. And uh, I wanted to tell you now uh, the rest of the story about yes. these two television stations. Uh, uh, we have been working for three years trying to get these stations. We've had disappointments about them. They uh, didn't, didn't work out real uh, well at one point in time. As a matter of fact, uh, they were sold before we, uh, we could raise the, the money. And we started praying about those uh, stations and asked God to, to, uh, to um, interrupt that sale for, uh, for the sake of the people up in those four counties because they need to hear the message of Jesus Christ to, to intervene in our behalf. And, about eight months after after that, we got a call from the seller there, and, and he said, are you still interested in the stations? And we said, yes. Well, to make a long story short, the, the, uh, they, we started off at a $4 million price they wanted for it. We negotiated 2.7, then they sold it, then, then uh, it came back and we negotiated a 1.9 million. Then, we, uh, then while we were raising the funds, the, the seller went bankrupt, so we started all over again, and we negotiated $975,000, and then uh, as a result, we did buy it yes. to yesterday. Yes. Praise the Lord. It closed yesterday for $900,000, another $75,000 savings. And now we're, uh, we've been praying about uh, Portland for a long time, and so we um, uh, got a, I've been talking to some people up in Portland who have stations, and comparable stations are the one that we that were negotiated uh, a price on, are selling for three million or three plus uh, three million plus, and so that seemed like a lot of money to us. But um, we were considering it, and, and out of the blue, a guy called me and said, "We've been on your website. We see what you're doing. We believe that God is behind this organization. We have a television station in in uh, Portland." and we'd like to sell it to you. And, and I said, well, tell me more. And he said, we'd like to sell it to you for $750,000. Now, that's a, that's a miracle, and that, that, in that market, it's incredible. But he said, well, you know, since uh, we won't have a broker involved, we'll sell it to you for $700,000. So we're, we're on our way to uh, raising the funds for that station as well. Uh, now, we don't, we don't have a booth here, but uh, we do have a relationship with uh, Dr. Frank and Rosalie Hurd. They have a booth. It's in three, 332, so they know how to contact us. They also uh, are pledging a certain amount of money for the, for the uh, 10 Talents cookbook that they have toward Better Life. So if you want to contact us, then you can get a hold of them, okay, at, in the booth. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ron and Marta. Thank you. Best of... of, of joy to you. Thank you. Yes. Now, who can finish this statement? A family that prays together. Well, what about a family that does ministry together? Will you see them in heaven? Tell us about that, Patty. Several years ago, we lived in North Carolina, and the seed for what we did that I'm going to tell you about tonight was planted there by some ASI member friends of ours who are here tonight, Linda and Sydney Whiting. They had the idea that we could go around and cover our own church territory going door to door, passing out health magazines, which we did. And our kids loved it, and all the other kids in the church did too. So more recently, we've been to GYC, and we, I, you know, was one of the senior citizens there, and observed that they fill up buses and they all, you know, all these kids go out door to door Sabbath afternoon. So I thought, you know, why couldn't we do this at home? So last um, December, we were, eating out in a little town 10 miles south of where we live in the town of Dunsmuir, California, an old railroad town, population 2,000, no SDA church presence, and we drove around that town a little bit and we got an idea. Um, so it was, the restaurant hadn't opened yet, and um, so we were waiting around and we kind of drove around the town. I was like, hey mom, 
this town is so, you know, there's, it's not alive. There's nothing going on here. We should go to door, door to door here. So what we did was uh, the next uh, few weeks, we went to church. We got up in front of the church and said, well, this afternoon we're going to meet at our friend Scott's house. And he got the maps for the city, mapped out the city, population about 2,000 people. So we had about 15 people, I think, the first Sabbath. We did some practicing in the church, some uh, did our, our test run, you know, practicing so we wouldn't be afraid going door to door. And we went out in the community, and in five weeks, we were able to cover the whole city. By the time we were done, we had about 30 members of a, about a 60 to 80 member church showing up, going door to door with us. It was really excited. Uh, William, you want to tell a little bit about what it's like going door to door? Why do we want to do this? Because some people say, isn't it kind of scary? Well, if you have any fears about it, um, the truth is anybody can do it. And the point to going door to door is not to look for the people that are going to shut you down. It's the people that are searching. And you meet the people where they're, where they're at and on their level, and you you're right there, and you can talk to them, and you show that you care about what you believe in um, by spending time and um, being willing to sympathize with them and their problems and whatever's going on in their lives. It's really great. So, Melissa, tell us a little bit. Did you meet anyone? What's come out of this door-to-door -door experience? Well, I believe it was the second Sabbath that we went out, and I, it was, I was having actually a really great experience. And um, I went to this one lady's house, and actually she opened, she was really friendly, she opened the door and said, come on in, and um, we told her what we were there for. And um, it, we eventually got to, to the point where she was like, um, we were like, do you want Bible studies? And so she said yes, and we have been, that's one of been my, um, that's been my summer night, um, Monday night activity for the whole summer. I've been um, going to the Bible studies and with one of the elders in our church, and it's been not, I'm, um, it's been a really great experience for me, and I just want to encourage all the youth out there, especially. Um, it is scary. It was the scary the first Sabbath I went, but it just brings you a joy that um, it bring, brought me a joy that I never felt doing anything else, knowing that you're reaching out to people that maybe otherwise you would not have been able to reach out to. Patty, why don't you tell us, um, there was a girl who was attending our church, and she had a response to how we went out, and then also talk to the response of the, of the people we've gone to and what programs that we need now to develop in our church to meet that need. Um, we paired adults with uh, young people because to make them feel more comfortable. And one of the girls that went out with me um, has a kind of, had had a sad life and a lot of things haven't been very happy for her. But on that Sabbath afternoon, it was we were going out, she said, if I knew I had this to look forward to every Sabbath afternoon, I would never dread Sabbath again. This is so much fun. So we praise God for that. And I wanted to add the way we, our door approach, we were trying to figure out how can we get into uh, reach people without them just shutting the door. And what you just heard about, Better Life Broadcasting Network uh, is our local 3ABN affiliate station. People can turn on their TVs at home and watch 3ABN over Better Life Broadcasting. So we went to the door, we'd say, hi, my name is Patty and I'm with Better Life Broadcasting Network. Or uh, are you able to get that station? And we asked what kind of programs they watch, what they enjoy, and we find the health programs, the kids programs, some prophecy. Many people are watching those programs. They're being blessed. If they weren't, we were able to tell them about it. We had literature, we passed them out, we gave out programs. Uh, the, and we also signed people up for Bible studies. It was just thrilling. In fact, I see here also tonight another family from our church is here with us. They're involved with this project and following up with Bible studies. We're so excited. So, Patty, in the last 10 seconds that you have, what is the appeal that you would make to the audience? We did not know what we were doing, and we explained that to our church. So we said, if you'd like to try this, we're experimenting. You can, in your own church, media is the best way to reach people. Find out how 3ABN, Hope Channel, or whatever it is, is available in your own area, and use that. Say, we are locally supporting this channel in our area. Do you get it? And use that as a medium to discuss all kinds of issues. Amen. And follow up. Amen. We Thank praise you. God Amen. for the opportunity. Thank you, Guthrie family. Yes. Amen. 
Now, you know, passion is a great motivator. Let's look at Saul. His motivation was to persecute. But then when he became Paul, his motivation was to proclaim. Well, here we have two gentlemen with another great passion, Wayne Atwood and Patrick Dubois. Dubois? And they're going to tell you tonight about their passion. Well, that's right, Denise. We do have a passion, and our passion is for the province of Quebec, Canada, first and foremost. Um, we really feel that there is a great need there in Quebec among the French-speaking people. And I just wanted to give you a little bit of an overview of the province of Quebec, because a lot of people ask me, where is Quebec, and a lot of questions about Quebec, because Canada might not be as well known as the United States is. So I just wanted to show you a few uh, statistics about Quebec, and then we wanted to, of course, talk mostly about the ministry. So we have some graphics here. For example, um, in Quebec, there are about 7.5 million people living there. In fact, in the surface area of Quebec, it's the largest province in Canada, and it's the second largest when it comes to population. Um, if we take just the French Canadians uh, that live there, there's about six million. But what is very interesting and in fact very sad is that if you take the Adventist French Canadians in the province, there are only about 500. That means there's only one to every 12,000 people in the province, which is far lower than most places in the world. In fact, even some places that we would consider practically untouched. So right here in North America, we have a place that is in dire need of the gospel, and we really feel that God is calling us to do the little we can to be able to proclaim that gospel. And one way that we feel is important to do that is by using media. And the Lord has been blessing us in using radio, and uh, we're going to talk about that first, and I think Patrick has uh, some things he's going to share with us about that. Thank you, Wayne. My name is Patrick Dupuis, <laughs> but it doesn't get any more French than that, so I won't hold it against you. We're just so privileged to have the opportunity to use media to reach uh, French Canadians with the gospel. And we've been working on a radio broadcast, a 30-minute program that is broadcast weekly in Quebec, but also uh, in France, uh, in uh, different parts of Europe on Radio 74. So it's been a blessing to move forward using media, especially radio. And I just have a quick testimony I'd like to share with all of you. Uh, as the program was being aired one evening, uh, soon after, we gave the contact information and we always uh, make available free of charge as Steps to Christ to those who want. And uh, a lady called and she said, you know, I'm amazed. I, I didn't listen to your program, but my husband uh, asked me to phone this number and uh, get this free book that you're giving called Steps to Christ. But the amazing part is that I've been a Christian for a very long time, and so have my children, and we've been praying for our husband and, and, and their father for many years, and he just wouldn't give his heart to Christ. And after listening to the 30-minute program, he, he came to see me and he asked me if I would please... Uh, call and, and obtain the book because he wanted to know more about Jesus Christ. So that was a really uh, wonderful experience for us, uh, experiencing the power of the Holy Spirit through media. And we regularly receive emails and uh, uh, people asking us questions through the internet uh, about the Bible and the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we're just so privileged to be able to work um, together, Wayne and myself, in this ministry that targets uh, French-speaking people worldwide. Wayne, would you mind telling us a little bit more about what the future holds for Better Living Ministry? Sure, I'll be happy to. I guess the Lord is the only one that really knows what the future is, but of course, uh, He puts in our hearts the desire to make plans and to see how the Lord will bless those plans. We're very thankful because the Lord has blessed with us. In fact, next month we're going to start recording uh, TV programs that we're going to be airing as well. And so we're very excited about that, taking it from the step of radio on to the next step where we can touch even more people. And it's our desire to continue to work. The Lord is blessed in us being able to have a small studio where we can produce right there on site. And uh, we're very thankful 
We're also very thankful for the doors that the Lord has opened for us to be able to work with our local church and our local conference because we are supporting ministry of the Seventh-day Adventist Church and that's fairly new in Quebec and so it's just so refreshing to be able to see lay people that are starting to get involved and active in doing things and, and to see the kind of synergy that we can have in the working together. So we're really, really excited about what the future holds, and we really want to invite you to keep us in your prayers because there is so much need out there for the French-speaking population. In fact, there are about 520 million people that speak French in the world, worldwide. So it is a very vast mission field. So we want to focus where we, are, where we live first in Quebec, but we want the Lord to be able to use it to touch other French-speaking people all over the world. And do you have a booth here? We don't actually have a booth because my booth is here behind stage. So if anybody wants to come and see me, I'm behind stage trying to help everybody to get on stage. Well, thank you, Wayne Atwood and Patrick Dupuis. Take care. Thank you. God bless. And now, I would like you to welcome Berniva Mulder. She is the founder of Youth Connect Incorporated. And uh, what exactly is Youth Connect? ABC Youth Connect is a um, cyberspace ministry for youth by youth, and it's designed for them to sense, feel, experience, and know the Niagara Falls of God's love. Amen. And what is the core of your unique ministry here? The core is eBible Dig events, and that's an online interactive teen Bible study that incorporates hot topics, prayer requests, and um, Bible and teen issues. Okay, well, take us a little deeper. This e-Bible dig sounds so interesting. What is it exactly? Simply, it's teens digging into the Word and sharing their life journey with God and blessing other teens around the world through technology. And so this technology, is it broadcasted live or is it... Uh, on the internet or is it pre-recorded? How does that work? All right, eBible Dig events are broadcasted live or pre-recorded and on location at academies, youth camps, um, youth rallies, churches. Um, we'll go wherever the teens are and even be creative. How about on the beach, wow. on the mountaintops, so wherever? You're utilizing technology. What type of technology are you utilizing? Um, the e Dig events are done through a web conferencing similar to what employers use okay. um, to conduct staff meetings with their staff. And um, we are using drama, um, besides a teen panel, um, music. So it's, it's very up to date. Now, I see this device on your ear. <laughs> what exactly does that have to do with Youth Connect? All right, this is a Bluetooth, and um, I'm actually on call 24-7. Teens and youth can call, email, text, anytime, day or night. And is there a particular evangelism that goes along with that, that it's called? Well, their main purpose that they're um, getting in touch with me is maybe to give prayer requests. It might be an emergency or a crisis. And um, one little aspect that I'd, lo I'd love to add to it is tag evangelism. Now, what is tag evangelism? Well, tag evangelism is simply emailing or texting um, current events and applying a spiritual message to it and planting that seed and allowing the Holy Spirit to do the sprouting. Excellent. And I understand you have a particular testimony from some one of your participants in this program? Yes. I'd Cassidy? like to Yes. Yes. I'd like to tell you about Cassidy. She's 18 years old. We met her through our e Bible dig events. She shared her testimony of her heartache and her life of abuse of eating disorders, of suicidal attempts, and self-injury. It's absolutely incredible to see how God can touch a life and totally transform and turn it around to give her or any life healing, hope, and a purpose. 
Cassidy is now learning to begin each new day with God, leaning totally on God, and she's learning to forgive to live. The triggers and the flashbacks and the hurt, the damages, cannot be erased in her past, but for her, Jesus is the radical answer. And by clinging to God, she's experiencing that there's nothing that can happen that between the two of them, they can't handle. So I understand you have something that Cassidy has written because of coming through this program? Yes. I'd like to share that this is a poem, and it's based on Isaiah 64, 8. It's called The Potter Designs. I walked into your shop one day to see you're working with some clay. You toiled and fashioned it so beautifully, a glorious piece for all eyes to see. But this clay, it kicks, it squirms. What? Does it not know? Yes, it still needs to learn. You are the potter, the designer of life. But it's fighting and causing you so much strife. I watch in astonishment your patient face. You respect stubborn choices and allow trial and error at one's own pace. This plate falls and breaks, plans failed, and deep heartaches, and tears with understanding slide down your cheeks. Oh, Father, why did you? Whatever went wrong, I ask you as you pick up the pieces so gentle and strong. Your plan is in action. You moisten and soften the cracks back on the spinning wheel. You restore its glory back. Your grace supplies everything it may lack. This time the clay is softened in complete trust, pliable, Obedience takes shape at your touch. Tenderness and character molded in the palm of your hands as you craft a piece so breathtaking, reflecting the sunshine rays of your sun. Yet, O oh Lord, you are our Father. We are the clay. You are the potter. We are all the work of your hand. Isaiah 64, 8. Amen. Thank you so Thank much, you. Bernice. Please pray for her. God be praised. He's working so much in these ministries. You know, thank you. Our next guest has something very unique to share. When, when preparing for baptism, the traditional approach is to give them a set of Bible studies on the 27 Fundamental Beliefs. Karen, however, Karen Lewis is our next guest. She has developed a set of Bible studies that has a unique approach in directing a relationship with Jesus. Would you tell us about that, Karen? I'll be happy to. First of all, I just wanted to let you know that <clears throat> really how it began is through my um, inspiration from Mark and Teeny Finley. Um, my husband and I, Steve, we we're from Chicago, and years ago, Mark Finley, a very young Mark Finley, you should have seen him back in the day, sideburns down to here, you know, um, did a series of evangelistic series, brought my husband and I into the church, and I saw Amen. the dedication and passion with which Mark and Teeny Finley have worked, and I want to tell you what a godly couple. But as my church had asked me to be a part-time Bible worker, I just sensed that I wanted to do how, whatever it is that God had called me to do. And what happened was this, we had a soccer team. And on the soccer team, um, we had some, a lot of non-Adventist people. One of them was Kathy. Kathy was going through a very painful divorce. Now she was, an ex, she was a Catholic, so one thing you gotta know about us ex-Catholics, we don't know anything about the Bible. We don't understand the gospel, okay? Well, Kathy, Kathy was going through a painful divorce and as we um, got a chance to get to know her and, and fellowship with her, 
she said, hey, my kids would like to come and visit your church. And I thought, really? I looked at her kids and the one was like pummeling on the other one and I thought, really? And I thought, oh, she wants to come and she's, you know, using the kids as an excuse. So I said, sure, we would love to have you come. And it's about 11 o'clock, so we were all excited. Kathy's coming to church. So she came to church and we're, we're you know, I'm hugging her. Kathy, come and sit over here. We were all excited. Well, after about the second and third time, Steve said to me, I think that's your first Bible study. Anyway, I said to her, Kathy, we have lots of, we have lots of, um, of our friends, our women friends that you already know from soccer. We get together at each other's homes and we, we, um, we rotate each other's homes. We bring snacks. We do Bible studies. It's a lot of fun. You should join us. And she says, oh, would you like to come for, and uh, do Bible study at my house? We're thinking, sure, we'd love to come to the Taj Mahal, Kathy, because she was very affluent. To give you an idea of how affluent she was, her divorce settlement was $26 million, okay? Very affluent. Well, I was all excited. My, this is my first Bible study. That week, I kept looking for a series of really great Bible studies on how to disciple her, on practical living, on Christian living. I went to the ABC, I'm looking, and there's wonderful Bible studies out there, but there was nothing that would really touch her heart as far as how to live the Christian life. And so the night before the Bible study, I'm desperate. I have nothing. Here, I'm supposed to give her my first Bible study. So I just fall on my face before God and said, God, please help me. I, I have nothing. And I sensed God saying, go to the computer and write how I give peace. I thought, okay, I got a C minus in, in writing in English, you know, in college. I'm not a writer. But I wrote, and I'm not kidding you, it was like the computer just took off. The first Bible study was how the Bible gives you peace, how we're all born with that hole in our heart and we try to fill it with things like, you know, relationships and, and marriage and children and career and power. But the only thing that fits is that relationship with Jesus Christ. And so I gave her that Bible study. She loved it. I thought, oh, next week I'm going to find this really great series of Bible lessons. Didn't find it. So the bi next Bible study is, well, she's got to learn the sin problem why you need a savior. And so I did, um, I did all of the research on it and lots of stories, lots of illustrations. And then she said, wow, that's a downer. I never knew that I was that bad. And I said, no, 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 the next two are going to be really great. I'm thinking, what next two? You know, what next two? So the next one was how God saved you, the beautiful redeeming love of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then why, uh, uh, what it was that Jesus died on the second, uh, the second death on the cross and how it shows his incredible love for us. By the time I finished with 28 Bible lessons, she was baptized. But not only that, I had an entire set of Bible lessons, the first nine, all about Jesus. And I want to tell you, Jesus said in John 12, 32, but I, when I am lifted up, will draw all men to myself. Who's doing the work? It's God. All we have to do is present Jesus. And I want to tell you, when you present Jesus and all his beauty and all his charm, it's like the air is electrified. It's like angels are all around you. And Jesus said, go and make disciples. How many of us really disciple people on how to live the Christian life, on how to really know Jesus personally? Many of the people in our own churches are unconverted. You know what I'm saying? And I want to tell you, when I, I train lay people in, in Denver, Colorado to use these Bible studies, and people who have never given Bible studies before are having baptisms. And their people are excited and bringing more people on. Amen. And guess what? I want to tell you something. This is, this is a testimony of Jesus Christ, and he gets all the glory. But out of the 85 Bible studies that I have given, 83 have been baptized. Amen. That is just amazing. Amen. And that, that is Jesus Christ. Amen. And so... If any of you would like these free Bible studies, how many of you would like free Bible studies? Okay, think about this. Here's the website, liftingupjesus.net. You're going to remember this. You want to know why? Jesus said, follow me and I'll make you fishers of what? Men. What do you use to catch fish with? A net, right? Liftingupjesus.net. Go on there. There's a series, 30 Bible lessons for adults. 16 for kids ages 7 through 12. It's a free resource. It's right now, entire conferences are using it. it. They're being translated into five different languages. Spanish is completed, Chinese is completed. We've got it in German, Korean, and Russian. And so God has told us, share him 
We need to share him. Use them. Go out into the highways and the byways and tell them how crazy Jesus is about them. Amen? Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Okay. So I think you've seen how God has used people in various ministries. I encourage you today, find how to share, how you can share. Amen. Let me introduce you to Scott Griswold. Scott is the director of the Buddhist Study Center in Bangkok, Thailand. Scott, how long have you lived in Thailand? We've been there the last seven years. And before this? We had some time also in Cambodia, church planting. So you have been now living among the majority Buddhist population for how many years? It's going on 14 years now. Why do you do that? So because there are millions upon millions of people who do not know Jesus Christ. How many Buddhists do you estimate there are in the world? It's hard to tell exactly how many because they mix it with Chinese religions and various religions, but I would say about a billion people are strongly influenced by Buddhism. One 
billion Buddhists in the world. Will Jesus come before the Buddhists are reached with the gospel? I don't believe so. I believe they are very much on his heart that he loves them and that he would miss them for eternity if they weren't there with him. How many, seven, how many people live in Thailand right now? There are probably 62 million people. And how many Seventh-day Adventists? Oh, around 10 to 12,000. And how many of those would have a Buddhist background? Not very many. Most come from animist backgrounds from the tribal groups through the mountains. So 62 million people living in Thailand, most of them Buddhists, and uh, very, very few with Adventists are, have a Buddhist background. Mm -hmm. Scott, what breakthroughs have been taking place in the Buddhist population in the last few years? God has really seen some fantastic things happen in places like Cambodia, Vietnam, where thousands have become followers of Jesus Christ. In other countries, it's been a bit slower, like Thailand and Myanmar, but it's beginning to happen with new little groups in totally new ethnic groups as well. We had only, after 100 years' work mm. in Thailand, about three Seventh-day Adventist churches in Bangkok until mm. four or five years ago. But what's happened in the last few years? How many churches or groups do we have now? We have, I think, going on 20, 22, somewhere like that, little groups popping up all through the city there. God is beginning to move in some unique ways, mm. and ASI is a part of that. Amen. How is ASI a part of this project to reach out to Buddhists? A couple years ago, they got behind financially, you folks got behind financially, a New Beginnings project to put together 30 special evangelistic sermons just prepared for people who have no biblical background, people who are Buddhists. Why do we need them? Can I open my Bible and study Daniel too? I'm an evangelist. You surely can, and God can use anything. But he also calls us to think about the audience that we're speaking to and come close to them, to their values, what they know, what they are feeling, and then make a bridge to his wonderful truths. Let's suppose I'm a Buddhist walking down the street. What do I think? What's my worldview? Do I believe in a personal God? No, you would not believe in a personal God. Your primary focus would be, I better do some good because of karma. If I do good, I will receive good. If I do bad, I will receive bad. How are these lessons that ASI is financing making an impact on the Buddhist mind? And what kind of topics do you start with? And how are they different from the traditional approach? The PowerPoint uh, lessons that we use, we've used both in public and personal evangelism. We have used it in Bangkok with city people, and they seem excited about it. It meets, we start with maybe their family problems, their finances, education, various things. But then we begin to introduce them to the God they don't know, the God they've never heard about before, that answers prayer, that has power to change their lives. Scott, you have begun a church there uh, in a group in your home. Talk to us a little bit about that. We have a Thai home there along the um, rice fields, along a little pond, and every Sabbath about 20 to 30 people come from our neighbors, from the town where we're at, um, some of them where we've opened our laptop underneath their house with the old grandma and the little children and the other kids and the cats running around. They are responding because, because they need it. Your landlady has been baptized. She was. Was, was she a Buddhist background? She definitely was. She mm -hmm. talks about when she used to pray to whoever's out there, she didn't know who, and God answered her prayer, sent us to rent her home, and later introduced her to know her Savior. How do you intend to use these resources? We hope not only to use them in public and personal evangelism, but then to let the, the way that we have presented it be something that can inspire others to video, to radio, and to website evangelism. So ASI is participating in a project to reach literally tens and thousands and millions of Buddhists. I sure hope so. I believe that God is just beginning to move upon His church. Not long ago, we've, we've known about many religions, but Buddhism has been kind of quiet, and people haven't really thought a lot about it. Now people are beginning to pray, people are beginning to plan to reach out to them in greater ways. Why is it that many people in the West are turning to Buddhism? I tell you, this is something that is really hitting me hard. Even just this trip home, I visited my hometown and found the city of 10,000 Buddhas there celebrating. It is the largest monastery in North America in my hometown. People are turning to Buddhism in the West, I believe, because they are not finding Jesus in the churches. They are looking and they're seeing a simplicity 
a, a search for purity, a harmony, uh, an anti-materialistic focus in Buddhism, and they like it. It seems to be helping people. What unique message do Seventh-day Adventists have to offer Buddhists? Well, before that very unique message, I believe that we simply have the most essential things that a Buddhist could need. Besides their morality and their good lives, they need a living God. They don't have that. They need somebody who can change their heart, give them power over their sins, help them love their enemy. Beyond that, they need salvation. And as Seventh-day Adventists, we present a gospel, a message that is fully life-changing. Many, many Buddhists are put off by this idea of cheap grace that you sin all your life and you just get forgiven. We present a gospel that, that goes deep to what they're searching. But when it comes to the special thing that Seventh-day Adventists have to share, it's extremely important because when a Buddhist looks at Christianity, they often just assume what is Western is, is Christian. Hollywood, politics, materialism, and they say, why do I need that? Buddhism is so much better in their minds. So when they begin to see a true Seventh-day Adventist caring Christian, they see something different. For instance, our message of simplicity. Jesus is coming soon, so don't waste your money on a fancy house, fancy car, let alone jewelry. Jesus is near. They can see it. They're seeking for harmony, for peace, for quietness in this crazy rat race life. What is the Sabbath about? But a 24 break from all that to seek what is eternal, to put aside the things of the world, to care for your family and your own health. There are many more things, but those are things you can look at in the lessons. If you are interested, you want to reach out to people who don't have any biblical background, come by our booth, 119, and we can share with you the CD that has been worked on uh, with these PowerPoints and the other materials for reaching out to Buddhists. God is using ASI in a powerful way to assist many projects in the world, and one way he is using it is to reach the Buddhist population. I'd like to pause at this point in the program and pray for one billion Buddhists in the world. And I'd like to pray that God will create openings that we now do not see. Amen. And I'd like to pray that God will raise up laborers. Last year at ASI, a young man responded to an appeal and joined Scott uh, in working for the Buddhist population. I believe that there are people sitting here tonight and people watching by television that God may touch your heart to make the supreme sacrifice and to spend time in an overseas mission assignment. Amen. Let's pray right now for one billion Buddhists and that God will raise up laborers. Will you bow your heads with me just Amen. now? Father in heaven, I place my arm on Scott's shoulders praying that you would continually bless him and his dear wife Julie and his children. They have committed 13 years of their life to live in mission service, and you are using them powerfully. I pray that you'd give them strength and health and wisdom. I pray a special blessing on the resources that ASI has provided. Father, may these resources be scattered Amen. by the tens of thousands to reach our Buddhist friends. And Father, when I think of one billion Buddhists in the world that have been barely touched with the gospel, many have no idea who God is. Many have never heard the name of Jesus. Lord, it's going to take a miracle to reach them. Amen. But you are a God of miracles, and I pray tonight that you'd open unusual doors and that the doors would be open for Buddhists to hear your word. And Jesus, we thank you that you are raising up laborers who make the sacrifice to leave the comfort and convenience of their home, that mission service still attracts the brightest and the best. Amen. And we pray thee that you'd raise up those laborers in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Praise God. God bless you. Good evening. It's time now for another one of our Members in Action segments, and uh, 
I hope you look forward to this as much as I do. I think it's one of my favorite uh, parts of, of our convention. It is truly worship, isn't it? Talking about what God has done in each of our lives. There's nothing, I think, that qualifies as worship more than that, praising the Lord for the work He's done. You know, it's interesting. I don't know if any of you have heard, but there are some Adventists who are involved in the mob. You heard about that? Well, I have a couple people with me here tonight. I have David Kleindienst and Madeline Hamblin, and they're going to tell us a little bit about the mob. First of all, we'll start with you, David. Can you tell us what organization are you working with right now? Well, first of all, MOB stands for Missionaries of the Blind. Oh, that's and, got their minds at ease. Thank yeah, you. it's a ministry that's operated by Christian Record Services, which is the Adventist Church's ministry to people who are blind and visually impaired. All right, thank you for that. Now, tell us a little bit about the MOB. Let's, let's go right to that, because that's a new part of your program that uh, well, a lot of us have heard of Christian Record, but tell us more about the MOB itself. Well, what well, works like this, we serve about 20,000 blind people throughout the world who get all kinds of reading materials from Christian Record. But what we would like to do is to make a personal connection with each one of them. And so we are looking for lay people from every church across North America who would like to have a ministry of visiting a blind person once a month. Okay, tell us a little bit more about how that works. How are you going to get these people connected to the blind that you work with? What we will do is we will give that lay person the name of a blind individual who lives in their local community who's been getting materials from us. And we would ask that lay person to visit once a month to encourage them, pray with that blind individual, and if they do not have a church where they can go, invite them to the local Adventist church. All right, that's excellent. That gives us a good overview. Now, Madeline, I'd like you to tell us a little bit about this, um, how you found out about the MOB program, since you're involved with it now yourself. Well, I have been praying and asking God to give me a wider witness, and soon I received information about the MOB, and I looked at all the material and thought, this is something I can do. I'm a busy person, and because I'm an ASI member, I know I should be witnessing. But this was easy, and so as a child, my parents had always taught us that we needed to be involved in helping people less fortunate. So I thought, this is something I can do. There's a need and an opportunity and something you say looked easy to you to do. Maybe to some people here it might look easy too. Tell us a little more about it um, in terms of how you found out about it in the first place. Well, I felt like God was, get, uh, was calling me to get involved in this ministry after I read the materials. And we all know that the world is filled with lonely and disillusioned people. And as Seventh-day Adventist Christians, um, we're really in a position to empathize with this type of a person. And so I know from experience that when I help other people, I am the one who gets a sense of helpfulness and that my joy greatly increases. Amen. Can you tell us about someone that you've met through your ministry? Right now I'm working with four people. I have two people who are very intelligent. They both have master's degrees. I'm working with a 94-year-old woman, and we take our beautiful collie dog, Lily, over to her, and she loves to pet this dog. And then I have, uh, I'm working with an 11-year-old boy. The first time I went to meet this young boy, I took our 12-year-old grandson with me. We took him a set of story hour tapes. And when we came to the door, the father was there. I called ahead before we came, and the father uh, was just so overwhelmed that somebody would come to visit his son. He said, in all the years that, this, that they'd have this child, no one had ever shown an interest, not even the school. Wow. So there are people that are out there, and they're lonely because they have this blindness that impacts them and separates them from others. Now tell me a little bit more about this, uh, this young man that you were talking about. What, what has happened with him since you've been working with him? Well, this young boy is mentally challenged, and the family are very overwhelmed. As I've been working with the blind people, I've, I've come to understand that not only do blind people need a friend, but the families need support. And so this next week, I will be going to the family of this blind boy, and they're going to show me how to help him and babysit for them so that they can have some relief. Okay, well now I want to turn a little bit different direction. What has happened to you? How has this impacted your life as you have worked with these families, these individuals? Well, you know, um, 
I really believe that I have gotten a lot of joy from working with these people on a regular basis, and we are having a Lifestyle Matters program in our church, and I'm inviting two of the people to come, and they've already said that they would come. So I'm f finding that our church is going to benefit by working with these people. And then I know that lives are changed, really, and they're brightened by my caring for them. And I see more clearly my own blessings when I work for other people. Also, uh, when we work for others, I think that we really give a spiritual legacy to our families that is more valuable than any monetary estate that we could ever leave. And I'm also grateful for that good feeling that I get. I like that good feeling that I get when I work for other people. There's joy in service to the Lord, there isn't is. there? A real joy in helping others. That's why he's asked us to partner with him in these types of ministries. Thank you so much for sharing with us this evening. Our next uh, ministry, I guess you would say, and interview, our next guest is Esther Doss, and she's going to be telling us about working now with the deaf. Esther, you've been working with the deaf for quite some time, haven't you? It feels like I've done it since birth. Elaborate on that, please. Well, both of my parents are deaf. And uh, my first time that I stood up to interpret, I was seven years old. Wow. So you, are, you have been working with the deaf all along, but there's something new that you've been doing, and that's what we want to talk about tonight. Tell us a little bit about the newest services for the deaf that you've been providing. I work with Adventist Deaf Ministries. Um, what we do is twofold. We, first of all, we do outreach to deaf people all over North America. And secondly, we try to nurture the current deaf members that we have. Um, the, the one thing that we've been working on is going to deaf expos. We have um, two different organizations that have expos all across North America, and they have about three to 6,000 deaf people come to one of these expos. It's like ASI, only everyone is deaf. So uh, we have these DVDs that we have created, and we pass them out like the leaves of autumn. We try to get them in everybody's hands, and they walk away with a packet of information. It tells them about God. It tells them that God loves them, and he wants them to be his children, and he is coming to get them. So you're giving away these DVDs at these deaf expos. I was just talking about blind. We're on deaf now. <laughs> yes. um, you've been giving these away. What is the content of those? Tell us a little more about what those have on them. Well, uh, one thing that we really notice is that the deaf community is highly secularized. They, um, there are about two million deaf people in North America, and studies show about two to four percent are even church attending people. Um, so we have a vast majority that don't even have a relationship with Jesus Christ. So the first DVD that we created that is in the packet tells them about God and that He loves them and He desires a relationship with them. And so what are they going to do about it? And the people have loved that so much. We have had many, many um, excited comments about it. And um, atheists have come to us saying how much they love this DVD. They are showing it in churches, with no matter what denomination they are. And we have noticed that people are accepting the Adventist people now because they realize we believe in Jesus Christ. Now, how many deaf people did you say are in the country? About two million. About two million. How many Adventists? There are about 300 or so. And tell us about the work that you're doing with the Adventist deaf and helping them, training them to work with others. Well, that goes on the second side of what our ministry does. We try to nurture our members, and they are so isolated all across North America. And we have been having this year what we call Deaf Reach. It is a lay training program because the best thing that deaf people can do is go out and reach out to their deaf friends. We have two pastors for the deaf in North America. They cannot do the work. They cannot meet all two million deaf people. So we have trained these, um, some of these deaf people, our deaf members. Uh, we have trained about 60 so far this year. That's a large percentage of our deaf membership. Also, at Deaf Reaches, what we do is we go to regions where uh, we have more deaf members, and we train them on how to give Bible studies. And they have been doing very well. They've already started their Bible studies, and we have, yes, yeah, 60 that have taken this training course in the last three months. Excellent. So you are training the deaf Seventh-day Adventists to be able to share with the deaf non-Adventists 
all around the world, all, well, all around our nation anyway. Mm -hmm. You did tell me you do have other languages, is that correct? Well, on, the, on one of our DVDs, we went ahead and added subtitling in four languages because we wanted to at least you know, do what we could to spread the gospel amongst deaf all over the world. Excellent. So then, this ministry that you're doing, tell us a couple stories. You were telling me a little bit about these expos, some of the interactions, some individual stories that have taken place as you've been at these uh, expos for the deaf. Well, um, I don't like to toot my own horn by any means, but uh, I have been to expos where, you know, in a new place, a new city I've never been to. And I've had deaf people walk across the aisle and look up and say, oh, that's, that's religion. I don't want to deal with that, ex you know, that booth. And they walk on, but they recognize me. And they come back and say, who are you? I know you from somewhere. And I just wait until they figure it out. And yes, it was the DVD they watched. And so they get excited. And then they say, you know what? Our, at our church, we watched this or, or whatever. And we've had a lot of those. But one lady in particular walked by. This was here in Phoenix, by the way, back in April. This lady walked by, she was one of those that said, I don't like, uh, and she walked by, recognized me, stepped back, and she tried to figure out who it was that I am. And she said, oh, yes, I have your DVD. And she started to tell me everything that was on the DVD. And I said, yes, 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 God is good. And then um, I said, uh, do you have my new DVD? She said, no, you have another DVD? And I handed her the packet she had just refused. And I said, it's in the packet. And she said, oh, I have to have it. I have to have it. And uh, so that was really exciting. But um, we have also talked with many atheists. There was one man who walked by our booth and saw that we were Christian. And he thought he had a debate on his hands. So he came back and he asked me, um, you know, I don't believe in God. Do you want to know why? And I said, well, OK, you don't believe in God. OK, sure, why? And he said, well, I, my best friend was a pastor, a deaf pastor, and he died. And I told him before he died, I want you to come down from heaven and tell me that God is real. He never came back. It's been 10 years. There is no God. Well, that was easy for me to address. And I said, of course he couldn't come. And he said, why, God wouldn't let him? I said, well, I guess you could put it that way. And so uh, we started having a study on the Day of the Dead. And he was so excited. And he was at peace. And he walked away with the DVD. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you for sharing this with us this evening. I think it's a wonderful ministry you're doing. And the Lord bless you in the work. Thank you. Next up is uh, Dick Nunez from uh, the Black Hills Health and Education Center. And uh, a lot of you uh, would recognize Dick. He's been up here with us a lot, shared about this before. But tell us, for those who don't know, what Black Hills Health and Education Center is all about. It's a wellness lifestyle program where we take people and help them change their lives. And also, we educate people as well. OK, so you're mostly about lifestyle. but. You've started branching out into several other areas. Can you tell us about some of the things you're doing a little bit more expanded? Well, you know what this old saying is, a picture is worth a thousand words, so why don't we show a few of those? All right. We have a very beautiful location. We're very blessed, and people feel like they found a little piece of heaven when they come out to our center. We have a medical program where we're actually doing a free clinic in Hot Springs, South Dakota, as well as helping people around the area and doing bone density scans to help people realize where their current health status is. And then we have a personal training program where we actually help the community. We have many people coming in, and we have a personal training school where we help people become personal trainers. And as you can see, they come in all shapes and sizes and ages. And then we have information classes we're doing. We reach out into the community, go out and speak, even in the little place of Hermosa. We do massages for people, helping them out with that. And we also have a massage school. And then we feed people. We teach them how to fix good, healthy food. And we provide the area with that good, healthy food. And we run a lot of special programs and have people come out, including ASI. They were out there. And then we have a lot of musical talent. I'm not part of that. So, but we do have a lot of other people that have great talent. And we so open that up to the community. And finally, this last picture shows a family, a Native American family that we reach out to. We take up collections for them, send it out to them. And what ends up happening is they're now getting excited about finding out about the gospel message. 
Okay, I'd like to back up a little bit about okay. one of the things I saw there was you were talking about the personal trainers and personal training trainers, them. Yep. I'd like you to talk a little more about that. What What is the, the plan for that? Why are you doing that? Well, because a lot of people want to get involved in health ministry, but they don't know what to do or where to turn. And so when you become a personal trainer, you actually have a chance to work one-on-one -on -one with people in a very, very close way. And by doing that, you know, the whole ministry of Jesus was to reach the physical needs of the people, which opens it up for the gospel message. And so we're working with people. They see tremendous things happening. It's a real blessing. I mean, just, uh, just yesterday, a man came up to me because of body and spirit and says, I couldn't walk. And all of a sudden, started watching your program, started doing the exercises, and I'm walking now. I mean, it's really exciting. Amen. So you're telling me that there's not just a physical aspect of this, but a spiritual one as well. Absolutely, because you can do all the lectures, the exercise, the treatments, the medical workup, all of that, but true healing isn't going to come until Christ is introduced in their life. Well, tell us about some of the people that have been impacted, especially in a spiritual way, if you would. Tell us some of the stories. Well, there was a man that came out who was a total atheist. He was a fireman. He and another fireman buddy came out. And they went through the program, and he was a heavy smoker. We did try and get him off his cigarettes, although he still snuck some. And then they left the program, and three years later, he came back. What we didn't know is this man now had terminal lung cancer. Mm. But what he wanted to do is get out to a place where he felt very loved and accepted, even though at the time he was an atheist. What we didn't know is he was coming out to prepare to meet God, truly. And he came out to the program, went through it again, he went through a non-medical part, so we never did catch on to his, his cancer. But before he left, we baptized him in our creek. Amen. Amen. So is that an isolated case, or no, do you no, do baptisms you know, there? We had eight baptisms that particular year. He was the first one that year. Because, see, we get a lot of people who would never go through an evangelistic program or to a Revelation seminar, but they'll come to a Wellness Lifestyle Center to learn about taking care of themselves. We had a man right after the Columbine tragedy who was a superintendent of schools of San Diego. And when he came out, he said to me after the orientation, I see you people are Christians here. And I said, well, yes. And he goes, I'm an atheist and I'm looking for one reason to leave this place. Give me one, two men to mention of God and I'm out of here. And so I said, well, I'd rather see a sermon than hear a sermon any day. And he goes, okay, I can live with that. So at, at the end of eight days, he was supposedly gonna leave but he said to his wife, let's stay a little longer. You know, they were going to do an Alaskan cruise, but she talked him into going to Lifestyle Center, even though he said, I don't want to get healthy. Women, sounds like your husband's, right? And so he came out anyway, and at the eight-day mark, he said, let's stay a little longer. And then at the 13-day mark, they did have to go, and during graduation, he got up and he said, I'm really glad I chose to come here. And his wife's like, <laughs> and he said, Dick said in the beginning, I'd rather see a sermon than hear a sermon any day. Not only have I seen sermons, I've felt them. I now want God as part of my life. And when Amen. you have situations like that, people who are atheists who now all of a sudden, they want to get to know God, or people leave our program and say, I feel like I, I taste a little bit of heaven. But I tell our staff all the time, and only for the Holy Spirit to work here, we as a staff have to put away all petty differences, follow the teachings of the disciples, come in one accord, because that's when the power of the Holy Spirit's going to work. And without the Holy Spirit, nothing's going to happen. And then you take it and reach out to the world, and that's what we're trying to do, evangelizing our community one person at a time. Amen. And that entering message, the health message, oh, helping uh, people awesome. get well, and the yeah. Lord works through that. Well, I think we have a recommendation for the folks here. Next time you're thinking about an Alaskan cruise, consider the Black yeah. Hills. And even though it's not me, get out there and exercise tomorrow morning. All right. All right. And you can uh, learn more about this. Uh, uh, Black Hills has a booth, uh, number 827. That's right. So stop by and visit that. Thank you. All right, our next guest is Ellen Metcalf from AIE. Now that's uh, something I'm going to have her describe to us right now. Hi, Ellen. Welcome. And uh, tell us, what does AIE stand for and uh, what is it? Well, thank you, Dan. Uh, we call it AIE because it's too hard to say the whole name every time. It's Adventist Institute of Entrepreneurship. And AIE is a network of business owners who mentor young people to use their business to spread the gospel. All right. And uh, what this is Adventist Institute of Entrepreneurship. Entrepreneurship. That's see a hard, why that we, is a hard see word. Why That's we why we say AIE. Why we use the initials. I'll refer to it as AIE from here on. 
So how does it work? Tell us about how the program is working and or how it's meant to work. What do you actually provide? Okay. We actually arrange a week-long business trip. We call it the business trip. And uh, where a AIE mentor, business owner, brings a young person to their home or to their and to their business, both, and shows them that intersection between business and ministry, shows them how they're sharing Christ in the marketplace. All right. Do you find that there are students interested in, in this type of a program? Actually, students are very interested in this, in this program. We did a survey at Southern Adventist University uh, about a year ago, and of the 53 students who said they wanted to use their business for the Lord evangelistically, 80% were interested in an internship like this with an evangelistically-minded business owner. Excellent. So do the business owners, are they interested in this? What do they get out of it? Tell us why they would be interested. Well, I want to tell you a couple stories about some mentors that, that are very dear to my heart. Uh, I have a friend, David, who owns assisted living facilities in Colorado, and he's mentored many young people over the years. And he actually recently hired a mentee of his, and she was she wanted to spread the gospel. Her name is Maria Nella. And as part of her business running his facilities as administrator, she wanted to share the gospel. She went to church her first weekend in the town and found that there were two members at the church. That was it. And within two months, Maria Nella, with her contacts that she had with her business and in the community, within two months of being administrator, she had six Bible studies. One was with a local Lutheran pastor. And she kept working with these contacts over the, over the time. And by the end of the, her first year in this, in this small town, she had two baptisms. She held an evangelistic series. She was preaching on, on Sabbath. And that little church is growing now instead of going the other way. Excellent. Well, I, I think this is very much like what ASI is about, isn't it? But you're starting people right at the beginning. When they get ready to start their business, you're teaching them, training them to share Christ in the marketplace. Exactly. Exactly. We want to give, we want to give everyone a chance to train a young person to share Christ in their marketplace, to give them that hands-on, that hands-on experience. Okay. Now, tell us just in closing here a little bit about how people can get involved. Tell okay. us how anyone here could be involved in this program. Okay. It's very simple. Business owners, as I know many of you are, you're busy, and we want to make it as easy and as simple as possible. All you need to do is log on to aieteam.com and click the link to host an AIE business trip. We uh, scan through all the applica applicants that come in, and when there's someone who's interested in your industry, we'll contact you and see if the time, the location, everything works out uh, for your schedule. We want to make it easy for you to give that hands-on experience to a young person that wants to share the gospel. All right. Do you have a, a way that people can get a hold of you outside of the website? Can they find you here personally and talk to you about Sure. This? I'll be here all weekend. We don't have a booth this year, but I will be here all weekend, and you're more than welcome to, to get a hold of me anytime. I wanted to share, if, if you ahead. don't mind, um, a, a, just a little snippet of how I want I, my vision is to share the gospel in, in business. Um, back in the 80s, Steve Jobs was asked about his vision for Apple Computer. And he said, instead of saying, I want to make a, a large profit or I want to build the next supercomputer, he said something very simple. He said, I want to change the world. And I want our young people to catch that vision to change the world for eternity. Amen. Thank you. Amen. Thank, Thank you, you Ellen. Dan. Our next guest is uh, Pamela Benton, and uh, Pamela's been doing some interesting Bible study and uh, a lot of associated things with that, and I'd like to uh, have her tell us a little bit tonight about uh, a book that she has and uh, how this came about. I'd like you to back up a little bit now and tell the people, um, how come did you do this book? Why did you write this book? What got you started down this path? 
Well, I think it started um, two days before we would take off on a tour. I'm Pam Bitt and the mother of the Benton Sisters is what I'm known by. <laughs> and um, we had an accident. Our stretch van did a snap roll, flip two and a half times, and I received the same breaks in my neck as Christopher Reeves. And at the scene of the accident, I had no feeling in my arms and legs, and I was blind. And the doctor said it wasn't a matter of whether I was going to be paralyzed or not. It was a matter of whether I was going to live. And God did a miracle. Here I am. And I'm not paralyzed. Amen. God is so good. And, you know, you want to know the Lord better when things like that happen. And I wanted to get into deeper study. And I had this feeling that if I could use the Strong's Concordance, then I might understand what the Scriptures were saying better. And, you know, there's a lot of winds of doctrine out there right, right now. And you have a tendency to have a hesitation at, at really under, getting into it and wanting to be involved with it. But the Bible says, um, test all things and hold, th hold fast to that which is good, right? And by understanding how to study the Scriptures, you don't have that fear anymore. And um, so I got the idea that the Strong's Concordance could help me, but I didn't know how to use it. And so I prayed, Lord, if you're leading me, please send somebody to teach me because I was figured everybody knew how to use a strong concordance but me, and I didn't want anybody to know I didn't know how, right? <laughs> and so he did. He sent somebody to teach me. And um, I started learning that when the Scriptures was translated into English, numerous Hebrew and Greek words were given only one English word. And when we read the scriptures, we read our English understanding into the scriptures and think we understand what they're saying, and we could be so wrong. That's why the title, Diamonds in the Sand. And by the way, my story of my accident is in here, and two other times the Lord saved my life. That story is in the appendix, as well as some really interesting things about the Benton sisters. <laughs> but... Um, one example of um, having a misunder having the Strong's Concordance or any other concordance bringing a deeper understanding into the scriptures would be Psalms 95:11. It says, "Because you do not know my ways, I say in my wrath, you shall not enter into my rest." Well, that's Christ speaking, right? What would you say the word rest would be? Go ahead. Well, you this, have the concordance, right? This specific word rest in this specific text is matrimony. And because you do not know my ways, I say in my wrath, you shall not be married to me. What is ways? This, because you do not know my ways, this specific word ways in is the road I walk, the path I trod. And since it's Christ who's speaking, which road does he walk? The road where his character, it shows his character, right? His character, the transcript of that is the law. So you could say, because you do not know my character or the law, I say in my wrath, what would you say wrath would be? going to let you answer that again, please. Anger? How about heartbreak? Because you do not know my character, I say in heartbreak, you shall not be married to me. So what you're saying is, is that you're using this to enhance your Bible study. That's Amen. the point of it. And, Amen. And this book, Diamonds in the Sand, now is this a study guide or tell us how this works. What does this do for us? This just has my studies in it and there's a whole bunch of them. I mean, I go into the latter rain and 
just by the definition of the words, and it's, you find it in the ABC, they have it here, and oh, I've done six more books since then. <laughs> <laughs> just well, good. Well, this one here is available, and I think it's very interesting, the idea what you're saying is you're learning to study with the concordance, and this can help other people do the same type of study. Is that That's right. People have told me it's changed their study life. When I come home, I find my phone is flashing because it's so full of people have called in and said, I've read your book, I've seen your DVDs, I want 10, <laughs> you know, and it's really exciting, and I've just been meeting people here that have said they've read the book or seen the DVDs and are really have been blessed and their study life has been more vitalized. Excellent. Well, thank you for sharing this. And again, as Pamela said, you can get this at the ABC right here or right at here. your ABC at home, wherever you happen to be. Thank you yes. for telling us about this. Thank you so much. And thank you too. And our next guest this evening is Robert Becker. And I just met Robert here at this convention and uh, learned some amazing things. First of all, Robert, where are you from and what do you do? I'm from Allentown, Pennsylvania. I'm an automobile dealer. A car dealer tonight. We've gone from the deaf to the blind to the car dealers and so on and so forth, right? So car dealers, is that a place you can actually share Christ in your marketplace? I think so. Well, tell us so. a little bit about your dealership. What makes it different? Well, for the last 47 years, my wife and I have been running an automobile dealership in Pennsylvania. Uh, it was on, known back in our day to start out closing on Sabbath. Uh, that's the biggest day in the automobile business, and uh, we found it to be a challenge, but uh, it's not as a challenge for God. So you're saying you've been closed all along, every that's Sabbath? Right. Every Sabbath. And you're still able to make a living? Well, we not only are making a living, this year we're up about 8%. Uh, now, wait a minute. You, wait a minute. We're in a down economy, right? That's right. I've everyone that's right. here has heard about the car industry, right. the auto right. sales industry. You're telling me you're not suffering? Uh, not really. We're very blessed, I'll say that. <laughs> and and I, I, I give God the credit because reality, that isn't something that just happens. I just believe God blesses. Certainly. We all know that, yeah, don't amen. we? Amen. The Lord blesses us when we do what He asks us right. to do. And so, tell us a little more about uh, some of that. Well, I'm humbled to tell you we've been maintaining uh, the number one position for the last 17 years in our district. Uh, this past year, we'll be number two in the nation. Uh, we're the largest super facility in the United States. And those aren't just something that I did. I just give God the credit, and I humbly say that. So in spite of being closed on Sabbath, the biggest day, yeah. you're saying you're the biggest dealership. Largest volume. Largest, largest volume. volume dealership. Largest largest volume dealership in, the, in our district. We're number two in the nation as far as volume, and we're number one as far as size of the facility in the United States. Amen. Don't tell me that God doesn't bless Amen. those Amen. who honor Him. Amen. Now, let me… I'd like you to share something else with the folks this evening you were telling me about. Uh, it isn't just that you're up the 8%. God has blessed you even beyond that, hasn't He? He has. We got a call a couple about, about two months ago from a national company, it's a rental company, and gave me an order for seven, just about 700 new automobiles. And that was like, thank you, God. Well, now you said it didn't start out quite that way, no, though, it did it? He started out, he told me, he said, I need like, his name is Kevin, he said, uh, I need like about 50 cars. And so I said, well, let's see if I can get them. So I called and I said, yeah, I can get those cars for you. He said, well, um, Okay, he said, uh, took those cars. The next day he called me, he said, could you get me more of those cars? I just called and I said, yeah, there's about 150 down there. Uh, no, I said, 225 cars. He said, well, I'll, I called him back, he said, I'll take those cars too. And of course, from that point, the next day he called for more, and pretty soon we were up to almost 700 cars and we're still counting. <laughs> So those are blessings. That's fantastic. So the Lord blesses you in yes. that. Now, you said that you do have opportunities because you're closed Sabbath to also have, you know, that's unusual. Do mm -hmm. people comment on that? Do people say things about that to you they in other do. areas? They do. And I've got, I've, I've got many that are, they, they sort of, when we tell them we're closed on Saturdays, they'll say, well, but when they're told that it's because of religious convictions, they look at it totally different and they really are really pleased to, and to give us accolades for saying that, and I, for doing that, I should say. 
Amen. Now, you were telling me about this man also a little bit, the one who ordered all these cars. Mm -hmm. Why? Why from you? Well, that, that was the question because my wife died when I went home that night. It just bothered me. But what he told me was that about 20, close to 20 years ago, out of Philadelphia Zone, we'd done some dealer trading with the dealer that he worked for. And he remembered that we were straightforward and was honest, and he felt that he could trust us. And that was the very word he used. Even though you were closed on Sabbath, huh? Or maybe because you were closed on Sabbath. He could have, he could have tried ordered those cars out of any other 650 Subaru dealers in the United States. He's working from us. And I'm really grateful for that and thankful. Amen. Yeah. Again, the Lord blesses those who yes. honor Him. Yes. And uh, I think that uh, that takes a real step of faith. And uh, it's an encouragement to me in my business to know that God will take care when we honor Him. Amen. 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 So, thank you. Thank Appreciate you sharing tonight. Our next guest is Michael Tuazon, and uh, he's our youngest. Come on over here a little closer. He's our youngest uh, interview this evening. I don't know how young, and I won't ask, but uh, I am always interested in the young people and what they do in the various uh, areas of our country. I, I see them rising all over the nation, young people feeling the call, hearing the call, hearing the Lord's voice, and stepping up to the task. And uh, Michael, you have been involved with an organization called Finish the Work. Tell us a little bit about that and how it got started. Finish the Work is the revival and evangelism arm for ASI Pacific Union. And we got started when we first decided, hey, what can we do to see Jesus face to face in this generation? And so a bunch of us got together and we said, let's go and grab all our friends and start reviving all the churches. Amen. Have you asked yourself lately, what can I do to see the Lord face to face while I'm alive? I think that's remarkable in itself. Now, you've started uh, another project just recently. Yes, there's a new project that finished the work started. We said, how can we do something amazing in our own hometown? A lot of times we do mission trips overseas. And so we said, why don't we do a mission trip where we live? So a bunch of us just decided, hey, what about we just take a challenge? We kind of all challenged each other to take time off of work, time off of school, and to do full-time evangelism here in the United States in California where we live. What do you call this project? We decided to call it The Misfits because we don't fit in this world. Not part of this world, are you? So um, when did this start then? It started at the end of November 2008, and in December a bunch of us were praying together, and we all realized that we all were on the same line. We wanted to do something different, something drastic, something amazing. And that's when a lot of us decided to either take time off of school. I actually resigned as senior project manager for the company I was working with and just said, all right, Lord, why don't you, I believe you're the same God in the Old Testament. I believe you're the same God who blessed Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. Why don't you bless us? And so we dared God to do something amazing. You dared God to do something amazing, and He did. He did. We said, all right, here we go. We formed a team, and we said from here on out till March, we're going to do full-time evangelism. But the problem was we didn't have any churches yet. And so who in their right mind would hire a bunch of unfit, untrained kids to run evangelistic series with uh, just a month of prep work? So you've got the group, you're ready to do the evangelism, but nowhere to do the work that you've taken up to do. Right. Well, at least in the first week. Okay. At least for the first week. Okay. Well, it didn't last long. How, how did you find a place to do the work? After the West Point training of evangelism, there was a pastor at Modesto Central who was just praying for God to send laborers. And we got just somehow connected, and I called him up, and I said, we have a team. We'll do an evangelistic series for free. We're supported by ASI Pacific Union, and we're ready to go. He said, I was just praying for that. So while you're forming your team, this pastor is praying for laborers. That's right. All right. And so you got together. Tell us a little bit about what you did. What, what did it take to accomplish the task? Well, we went to Modesto, and then, uh, which is one of the biggest churches in Central California Conference, Modesto Central. And then from there, we went to Turlock. And I'll tell you two really cool stories Please. what happened there. I want to introduce you to Anthony. Anthony is a young man who worked at Pep Boys, and he heard the call for him to do full-time evangelism. So he resigned from his job, or actually took a, a leave of absence. And when he went there, he realized, okay, well, Lord, I need to have this amount of money saved. 
And so he looked at his bank account and he had just that amount of money. So he's like, all right, God's calling me to full-time evangelism. And while we're doing the series in Modesto, it turns out one day he looked at his bank accounts to pay his bills and it turned out everything was wiped out. A family member had gotten a hold of checks and had um, cleared out his bank account. So he's planned to do this ministry because he has the means available to do it, and now he finds out he has nothing? That is correct. So now the ball is in God's court. You know, God works best when we can't work at all. Amen. That is the truth, isn't it? And so what happens next is he then pr has to make a decision. Is he going to go back? He can go back to work. Or is he going to go by faith, knowing that he was called for it, and, know, and having faith that God will deliver? What choice? He decided to go back. And when he decided to go back, it turns out that just the, in, in two days, people uh, donated uh, some money towards him that covered above and beyond that, the amount that he saved on his own. And this is important because the next series was in Turlock, and that's where his family happened to be. And he was the first person who was baptized Adventist. He was a non-denominational Pentecostal, and he was sick and tired of being the only Adventist. Turns out he had family in Turlock who had, the last time they saw him, he was 310 pounds and cursed like a sailor. Uh -huh. This time they see him, he's totally different. They don't even recognize him because he lost 110 pounds. Wow. And people ask, you know, about Subway. Let me tell you, just follow the health message. You'll lose pounds. <laughs> Amen. Amen. So sure what yeah. happens next is he then gets his family to come to the meetings. They get baptized. And we finished two of our meetings. And we said, all right, Lord, we did two meetings. And, you know, a number of decisions were made. We had over 30 to 40 decisions for baptism. And we were like, all right, Lord. Wait a now, minute. Now Wait a minute. This is your first, the first? The first two. Out. The first two out. And you've already got... 30 to 40 decisions for baptism. Yeah, the first one we had 15 decisions, and the second one we had 20. Amen. Amen. Well, so the Lord was blessing this work. Okay, continue on with your story. I didn't want to go by that. No, notice. not at all. Well, what happens next is at the very next series, Anthony's brother, who is a seven-year smoker and a three-year black tar heroin addict, decides that he needs to make a change, and so he goes to the meetings in Watsonville, California. Okay, so now you've done... Uh, Modesto, Turlock, and you're on your way to Watsonville. And it's only April. Okay, it's only April. So the Lord has provided places for you to do evangelism. Yes, good. All yeah, right. We started okay. getting all sorts of places now. Okay, so now you've got a, a heroin addict. Is yeah. that correct? A black tar heroin addict, a smoker since 13, has a kid. He's 20 years old. He comes to the meetings, realizes that he needs to make, uh, change his heart. Here's the first evangelistic meeting, and from then on, he wants to quit smoking. He, he, remember, he's been smoking since he was 13 years old. That night, he prays for God to take away his addiction. He says, Father, let this cigarette smoke taste like the worst thing ever, and God answers that prayer, and from then on, he hasn't smoked cigarettes. Amen. God still works miracles, doesn't He? Amen. In the individual as well as your organization. Um, tell us a little bit about where you went next. Now, that's the one I really was interested in. All right, cool. So Thomas then ends up getting baptized, and he, the one who's a, a seven-year smoker, three-year uh -huh. black tar heroin addict, he gets baptized and then joins the misfits as well, and we now go to our last series in Salinas. So what you're saying is, is that, that he is fresh in his experience and he immediately joins up and becomes one of the evangelists? That's right. And that's the training program you that's have, right. huh? That's we're right. Okay. We're a bunch of nobodies trying to lead somebody so we can reach everybody. Amen. <laughs> Amen. You told me that you have uh, two necessary qualifications to be a part of the misfits. Yeah, as long as you have the desire and as long as you have a humble heart. The desire and a humble heart. Doesn't uh, Ellen White tell us what we need to do service for for the Lord? Yeah, it doesn't take much. The willing heart and humility, right? That's right. So go on with the story so we, now. So we then go to Salinas, and now we're at our last series, and this is a church that is in disarray, about 70 members only going to church, and they want us to come in and somehow fix everything. And now, when you like, say disarray, what do you mean? Those, this evangelistic series almost didn't happen. You know, there were just things going on in the church, okay. and, you know, we didn't know about all this stuff. We just come in, and we're like, all right, let's blitz this area. And so we decide to send uh, our evangelistic flyer, which is called Unlocking the Mysteries of Daniel and Revelation, in every single newspaper in the whole city of Salinas. We go to all these different Sunday churches. We actually get asked to do a Vesper or a Wednesday night prayer meeting at a Sunday church. And all these Sunday church people end up coming to our series. We had over 100 plus visitors 
at this series of only 70 Adventists attending. Right, so you've got a church of 70 members and you've got 100 non-Adventists attending your series. That's right. Okay, so what was the outcome of that? Well, God really poured His Spirit at this one. There was over 60 decisions for baptism. Over 60? How to double your church. Yeah. And again, we don't, we can't take any credit for anything. Again, we're unfit, we're untrained, we're the misfits. All we did was pray really hard and we just did our best. We just you know, read the things that we needed to, we studied really hard, we labored with the people, and by God's grace, you know, we were able to reap uh, results. But I want to share one really cool okay. story. This happened to Thomas again in Salinas. He's now trying to reach the heroin addicts that were, that which he was a part of, and actually during the series he was held at gunpoint and robbed. And he wondered, why did God allow him to spare his life? Just a few weeks ago, he's now a cold porter and literature evangelist in Central California. When he was knocking on the doors, at his last door, someone, after he sold, I believe, a man a piece, they gave him two water bottles. And he was like, okay, why are you giving me two? And the lady was like, well, one is also for your friend. And he says, friend, no one's been working me all night. And he then says, what does my friend look like? And she says, you know, the guy behind you who's eight or nine feet tall? And so Thomas realized that during that time in Salinas, God spared his life and his guardian angel was right there just as it was a few weeks ago in his colporting experience. Amen. Now, just in closing here, I'd like to let the people know that they can find out more about the misfits at the booth for Pacific? ASI Pacific Union. ASI Pacific Union chapter. It's something to learn about, and uh, Michael will tell you a whole lot more than he's told you this evening. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you.